you prefer to uh, speak from your seat, that's fine. Uh, I, may, I may get up at some point, but... <laughs> do, do whatever works best for you. Okay. So is this right? Is in the back? Or out right outside he comes in? Or will we start? <coughs> I can't remember. Are you going to be able to join us for dinner tonight? Hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, we will miss you. You know, I, I'm, I'll be, I'll be long gone. <laughs> by Fair the enough. Day. Fair enough. Well, we'll talk about you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, well, we, we will hope that you can make yeah. it, and if you can't make it, we'll certainly understand. The only thing I could do is I could come for like you know, half an hour or something just to chat in the beginning and then leave. Why should I say that to you? What makes the morning good when I see you? It's called being polite. Ato. 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 I know we have other people coming in, but since you all get the A plus for promptness, we might as well not punish you by, by waiting for everyone else. Uh, good morning, I'm Bob Hathaway. I run the Asia program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, since some of you, and particularly those who might be watching this from Pakistan or India or other places, um, are not regular visitors to the Wilson Center, permit me to say just a bit about the Wilson Center. Um, we're an independent, nonpartisan uh, institute for advanced research here in Washington. We are created by the U.S. Congress back in 1968 um, as the nation's official memorial to its 28th president, Woodrow Wilson, uh, the only president, incidentally, who had a Ph.D. We seek to promote writing, research, dialogue on vital current issues of the day as well as their historical and cultural background. We annually bring to the center about 150 visiting scholars from around the world um, where they produce an extraordinary wealth of books and articles. Uh, we organize and host more than 700 meetings a year, such as this one. Um, and we strive to serve as a bridge uh, between the world of the scholar and the world of the policymakers uh, to commemorate both the scholarly depth uh, and the public policy concerns of President Wilson. Nearly a decade ago, the Wilson Center uh, made a decision to substantially increase the attention uh, we pay <coughs> to Pakistan. Uh, one indication of that heightened interest in Pakistan um, is an appointment we make each year uh, of a Pakistan scholar um, who comes from Pakistan to spend nine months uh, with us each year. Um, our current scholar is the distinguished journalist, Zahid Hussain. Uh, Zahid, would you want to raise your hand? Uh, Zahid is our current scholar. Um, we hope to announce in the next few weeks uh, our next scholar. Our conference today is another example of what we are trying to do to uh, encourage uh, greater understanding of Pakistan and the challenges Pakistan faces. Um, we host one of these uh, major economic conferences uh, every year under the auspices of the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan, of which I'll have more to say in a minute. 
Um, each of these conferences focuses on a particular challenge confronting Pakistan, food, food security one year, uh, water, energy, the country's demographic uh, bulge. Um, each of these conferences has produced a substantial report. Uh, there will be one uh, forthcoming after this conference. Uh, because you have signed up for this conference, you will receive notice that these are available and they're free. So we'll make sure that you get one. Uh, today, in, in the conference report uh, that will be produced in the coming weeks, uh, we seek to examine the growing likelihood that Pakistan and India are poised to take a quantum leap forward in expanding their trade ties. Uh, both nations have taken a number of steps in that direction in recent months. Perhaps most notably, Pakistan's announcement last fall that it intends to accord most favored nation status to India, uh, a decision that one recent analyst uh, has described as, quote, a game changer. For once, the experts agree. Uh, expanded trade between these two countries can set up a win-win situation for both sides. Uh, it can bring substantial economic benefits to the business sector, to workers, to consumers, and not incidentally to the national exchequers of both countries. And by creating constituencies in both countries for normalized relations, it can help move them beyond the enmity which has bedeviled their relations uh, from the moment of the two countries' creation in 1947. That having been said, much remains to be done to actually expand trade ties. Uh, and as always, the gap between declared intentions and actual implementation can be huge. Uh, even so, this is a time of hope, of new possibilities uh, in South Asia. Um, and that, I think we'll all agree, represents uh, a most pleasant development. Now, before getting started, I need to make a handful of announcements. Um, we are webcasting this, and your mobile phones play havoc with our webcasts. Um, so not only as a matter of courtesy to our speakers, but also so the webcast actually works, um, I would ask each of you to check your uh, mobile phone now and, and make sure it's off. We're going to be meeting in this room uh, throughout the day. We'll have uh, lunch set up outside. We'll be eating the lunch inside. Um, restrooms are right down the hall uh, behind me uh, to the right. Um, we will give you, during the course of the day, several opportunities to get involved in this discussion. Um, we would simply ask that we, uh, you wait until the microphones uh, are passed to you and that you identify yourself uh, prior to your comment or your question. Uh, putting on a conference such as this, of course, produces many debts. Uh, first, uh, to the speakers for the day's event, uh, many of whom who have, dim have uh, come literally halfway around the world uh, in order to share their experiences and their expertise uh, with us. Uh, that's why we're here today and we thank them immensely. Uh, secondly, I wish to thank those in Pakistan and the United States who have demonstrated their confidence in the Wilson Center's Pakistan program by the very tangible means of supporting us financially. Um, and in this context, I want to particularly mention the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan, uh, which is a Karachi-based charitable trust um, whose support has been indispensable, uh, not only for today's conference, but for our Pakistan uh, scholar appointments uh, over the years. Uh, the fund is represented here today by its chairman, Munawar Narani. Uh, all the way on the left at the end of uh, the table, whom I will invite to say a few words in a moment. 
Um, also with us today is a member of the Funds Advisory Council, uh, Bill Milam, former U.S. Ambassador to Pakistan and currently a Wilson Center Senior Scholar. Um, I cannot say this loud enough or often enough. Um, Manoir, the Wilson Center, and I personally are immensely indebted to you, uh, to the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan, uh, and I am pleased to once again say that publicly uh, in your presence. Um, third, uh, to our Wilson Center partners who have co-sponsored this conference, uh, the program on America and the global and, and the global economy, uh, led by Kent Hughes. I'm looking around. Is Kent here? I don't see Kent right now, uh, but I want to thank uh, Kent and his program. Uh, finally, and in some ways most importantly, however, to the Asia program staff. Uh, Michael Kugelman, Michael, if you'll raise your hand. Uh, Joshua Spooner, Joshua may be outside, I don't see Joshua. Um, others have helped us as well. Uh, Sandy Fu, I don't think Sandy's here right now. We have several interns who are helping us. Um, anyone who's ever managed anything knows that these people that I've just named are the ones that do the real work. Um, so if you'll say a thank you to them uh, on the way out, uh, I know that they will appreciate it. Manoir, I now uh, invite you to say a few words. You can either sit there or come to the uh, podium here. You all have um, his biographical blurb, um, so rather than tell you what you've already read, um, I simply turn things over to you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here and participating in this conference. Uh, before getting on to anything else, I have to start with an apology in that I do have a day job. I work for Citibank, and unfortunately, I have to leave at 1.30 uh, because Citi is winning a number of awards in aviation in New York, uh, and a number of our clients are going to be there, including, uh, believe it or not, uh, we are winning a $100 million Islamic financing transaction for Pakistan International Airlines, and they will be there too. Uh, but I wanted uh, to be here uh, because of a number of things. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan. <coughs> it is a charitable trust established by four Pakistani businessmen and myself. Uh, it came out of a need that uh, the former director of the Wilson Center, uh, Congressman Lee Hamilton, uh, felt uh, it was to be able to present Pakistani viewpoints from an academic point of view and to try and bridge the gap uh, <coughs> that was felt between academia and policy making about Pakistan and to be able to project those views here at the Wilson Center as well. The success, it was a small initiative that started out of uh, my relationship with Congressman Hamilton, and it is Bob Hathaway and his team who have made this, I think, into a very successful Pakistan program uh, in Washington. I also want to tell you that there were a number of people who were very encouraging when I was starting out, uh, and I am delighted that actually two members of the Advisory Council of Fellowship Fund for Pakistan are present. Bill Milam has been helping us uh, since inception as a member of that council, but one of the people that was most encouraging to me in setting the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan was the then Central Bank Governor, who is a member of our advisory council, Dr. Ishrat Hussain, and I'm so delighted that he's back at the Wilson Center as well. The second reason that I wanted to be here is to talk about when Wilson Center suggested that we should have a conference on Pakistan, India, trade in Washington, I have to tell you, my initial reaction was, why? Why in Washington? And why does it really matter? Yes, MFN status has been given. India gave it 16 years ago. Pakistan has given it now. But that, it, but that in itself is neither here nor there. <laughs> if you are going to restrict it to industries where you only have a competitive advantage in each country, it doesn't work. It hasn't worked. It won't work 
in that manner again. When I spoke to my trustees, who are all businessmen, they were all incredibly encouraging that this should happen. And I can assure you that 20 years ago, it would not have been the case. So something has changed. And what has changed, I think, is that there is a non-emotional debate that has started about this. And Washington allows, hopefully, for that momentum of a non-emotional debate to continue. There is a sense in Pakistan that without addressing the core issues, the benefit is to India. This has always been the case. But this is changing. And we felt that it is important to go beyond just having a sense. There are two kinds of senses. One that says, certainly in the Pakistani context, and I would expect that there are people in India who have this, it is all about a perception and a sense. Yes, the benefit will be to the other party. I am one of those who only have a sense. It is now, as things are changing, our job to see whether we can go beyond this feeling of a sense and actually work towards an empirical knowledge of how things can change and be better, both in an economic and business sense, or as my friend Amin Hashwani is going to talk about, in terms of a social sense and a societal change. And I think there is an opportunity here today to perhaps be able to get beyond just a perceptional and a sense issue in both countries. There are political and strategic issues. Uh, we could go into those, but I am personally reluctant to talk too much about them, to have them overshadow those, because it is far more important to get the business economic and societal aspect right and understood and disseminated amongst the people so that that creates the momentum to work on the political and the strategic issues. And I can tell you from my personal experience that this conversation has changed in the last 20 years and why the momentum has come in Pakistan is because of the work done. <laughs> by the academics and the economists today, by institutions in Pakistan like the IBA and LUMS, and presumably in India by some, some of the uh, institutions as well. Finally, I want to close. I was walking by uh, the Wilson Center's uh, monument to Woodrow Wilson, and I noticed a saying, which I think is very apropos. The man who has the time, the discrimination, and the sagacity to collect and comprehend the principal facts and the man who must act upon them must draw near to one another and feel that they are engaged in a common enterprise. Help us collect and comprehend the principal facts so that we can work towards a common enterprise. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, on the first panel, you have been given uh, an important task uh, by Munor. Uh, we are now going to move directly into the first panel. Again, I'm assuming that you picked up a copy of everyone's bio. Um, so I'm going to give you only very abbreviated uh, introductions of each of our speakers. Um, I'll introduce um, Ijaz Nabi, um, and then following his presentation, I'll introduce the next speaker. Um, Ijaz Nabi uh, is a visiting professor uh, and former dean at arguably what is uh, the best or certainly one of the top two, three universities um, in Pakistan, um, the Lahore University of Management Sciences, or LUMS. 
Um, he is, um, among other things, um, a member, <coughs> member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Um, and we almost uh, missed him here because uh, that council has a uh, uh, important meeting uh, that he has to rush back to. But uh, Ijaz, we're delighted you were able to uh, uh, come here uh, prior to that meeting. Um, Ijaz has uh, written and published extensively. I'll simply mention um, uh, that uh, he also served for 22 years at the World Bank in Washington, uh, where he was manager of economic policy for South Asia. Uh, Ejaz, welcome back to the Wilson Center. We look forward to your comments. <coughs> Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Put a little closer. Um, you know, when I was uh, uh, at the World Bank, and I used to do a lot of long-haul travel uh, working on the East Asia crisis, I had developed a, a, a principle which was um, never work on the fourth day of the mission because my bi biological clock really floors me on the fourth day after a 20-hour flight. And I have made that critical mistake. Today is the fourth day, and here I am uh, trying to convince you about the potential of, the, uh, of, of uh, this initiative in South Asia. Um, so what I'll, I'll do, I'll try and go as far as I can, uh, and if I uh, fall asleep, you will kick me from under the table to wake me up. <laughs> um, you know, the issue, uh, there's a, a lot of work has gone, has, has gone into uh, where we've reached on, uh, on this initiative. Um, it started um, initially uh, under Benazir's government in the mid-90s, uh, she asked the Ministry of Commerce to do a very comprehensive report on what would be the impact of opening up uh, trade with India. There was, uh, there was some trade with India, but it had been uh, uh, heavily uh, regulated, heavily curtailed on the basis of a positive list. Um, and it, it was a very comprehensive report, and the report did two things. It did a very careful stakeholder analysis. It looked at the impact of, uh, of opening up on consumers in Pakistan, and uh, whatever measure was taken, uh, you know, the range of products that would become available to the consumers, domestic competition, and therefore the impact on prices for the consumers, um, especially the impact on prices on fresh produce, et cetera. And it came to the conclusion that consumers would be unambiguously better off as a result of this opening. The second important stakeholder they looked at, uh, that report looked at, was uh, the farmers in Pakistan. And uh, uh, given the rapid improvement in technology uh, across the border, uh, it was felt that the biggest uh, gain to Pakistani farmers would be uh, getting access to the new technology that was being developed at Indian agricultural research institutions. And uh, crops where Pakistan was far ahead of India uh, at that time, uh, in the mid-90s, uh, like raw cotton, et cetera, uh, there, of course, Pakistan would be able to export technology. But in crops, particularly sugar cane and, and other cash crops, uh, the technology flow would be uh, towards Pakistan. And then again, the farmers uh, would be huge beneficiaries of that opening up. There was some concern about the heavy subsidies that Indian farmers, particularly in Punjab and Haryana, enjoy, and what that would do to the uh, uh, deep uh, liberalization of prices that had taken place in Pakistan. But still, the overall concern was that because there would be a, an improvement in technology, yields would improve, and that would dominate uh, the other effects. Uh, the next group that was analyzed very carefully, uh, because uh, we had, uh, uh, because uh, I say we now have given away, I was, uh, I was actually asked to lead that report uh, by the government. Um, uh, we, we, we did a very careful analysis of what the impact on the manufacturers would be. Because this is where the greatest competition uh, we felt would come, and this is where there would be some strong, lobbies in Pakistan who would get adversely affected, lobbies that had 
industrialized in an environment of import substituting industrialization for several decades. So uh, fortunately, uh, UN trade data were available and very, very detailed analysis of revealed comparative advantage was done. And we were surprised at, uh, um, at uh, how competitive Pakistani manufacturers actually were. Uh, the competitiveness indicators that were being used uh, by the literature at the time was to divide up your exports into what they call rising stars and falling stars and lost opportunities and retreats, which is simply to say you look at a product and see what is happening to your country's share of that product in the world market for that product, and then compare it with what is happening to that product in overall market for, for exports in the world. And uh, the more of your products were in the rising star category, the more competitive you were. The less of your products were in the lost opportunities, the more uh, uh, in retreats, the more competitive you were. And we, we, we graded Pakistani uh, uh, exports, uh, and we, we, we were surprised at how competitive Pakistan's uh, export structure was, and, and you can see that from this table. Uh, the share of Pakistani products in, in the good categories was relatively higher than in India's. Uh, I have to be careful, this is UN data 1985 to 1992. Um, we did for speci specialized groups of uh, industries like textiles and, uh, and uh, engineering, we did uh, fairly detailed three digit, four digit level analysis, uh, again, to show that in a range of products, Pakistan uh, manufacturing was, was quite competitive. So, the report therefore concluded that look, vast majority of stakeholders would benefit from opening up. Uh, no static analysis can predict what the dynamics of trade <coughs> liberalization would be, but we all know from trade theory that you, you gain from, uh, from trade, and therefore we put our faith in that. And then of course, with greater trade across the borders, the biggest beneficiary would be the government, because there was cross-border trade, there was trade by our third countries, and bulk of that trade was not being captured uh, in terms of yielding revenues uh, to the government. So we felt the government would be a huge beneficiary. Uh, we estimated that uh, if, if all of the illegal and third party trade were to be uh, uh, legalized and would go across the border, government's additional revenue would be a quarter of what that the education budget at that time was. And therefore, that is additional money that could be put to good use, so we said, you know, it's, it's so obvious, where's the problem? So we made the presentation to the cabinet, we got uh, the approval of the cabinet, and uh, Benazir asked us to, to launch the, the, the report, and we went and started to meet various chambers, et cetera, and we were surprised at the strong reaction against the report. The chambers in particular, and the, the, the budding automobile sector, in Pakistan in, in particular was, uh, was very apprehensive of the implications. And what I was very surprised at was that it is a very small proportion of the total stakeholders in the country, and yet they commanded such a powerful voice in the country. Uh, but we know the history, uh, that initiative didn't get very far in terms of actually changing anything, but I still believe that that report has formed the basis of much of the analysis and much of the discussion that has taken place in Pakistan since then. I'd also like to believe that it has informed the discussion and debate on the Indian side as well, because my friends and colleagues from across the border would continue to ask for copies of that report for several years uh, afterwards. But since then, a uh, number of other uh, studies, the World Bank did a series of studies, uh, uh, Peterson Institute, Mohsen Khan at the Peter Institute has done several studies. Uh, Mr. Shah Javed Barki, uh, an eminent Pakistani economist uh, formerly at the World Bank, he has done, looked at bilateral trade in the context of the Kashmir dispute. Uh, your own uh, W. Uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center's uh, book, Hard Sell, had a chapter on this. And most recently, Pakistan Business Council which is a, a group of, uh, of the more progressive uh, large uh, corporations in Pakistan. Uh, they got together and they did, a, for the first time, they got involved in, in, in 
policy debate, uh, uh, on public policy issues, and put out a report for the government. There were four uh, panels that they put together. One of the panels was on bilateral trade between India and Pakistan, and uh, uh, that report very categorically uh, uh, recommends going forward uh, uh, with this bilateral trade. So the question is, given all this, the history, the intellectual history of this debate, and given the large number of stakeholders who support the idea, why, why has there been this reluctance? Um, and it isn't just the army which has, uh, which has been discouraging. Uh, there, is a, there is a history. The history of India-Pakistan economic relations is, uh, is something one should, one should read. Uh, I got hold of uh, the early budget speeches of Pakistani finance ministers. Uh, finance Ministry of Pakistan has put out a volume which is the annual budget speech of the finance minister starting with 1947. And when you do that, it really informs you about the early economic uh, history and the struggle between India and Pakistan because uh, there was an issue of, uh, of uh, how to share the debt, uh, how to share the assets, how to share the liabilities, uh, what to do with the reserves, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And a, Back in the, in, soon after 47, India was the largest trading partner uh, for Pakistan. Uh, almost 50% of Pakistan's exports went to India. Uh, a lot of that was ju jute from what was then East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. And almost 40% of Pakistan's imports, mostly manufactured goods, came from India. The Korean War happened. As a result of the Korean War, terms of trade for commodities shot up, and Pakistan was a commodities exporter. Pakistan saw that as an opportunity to, put, to begin to put in place a strategy for import substituting industrialization. Indian rupee, Pakistan rupee, they were both tied with the, with the, with the British pound. The British pound devalued against the dollar, India followed suit, Pakistan said, no, we will not devalue. And that resulted in a trade war between India and Pakistan. India said, your jute has become too expensive for our mills, therefore they cut back on jute. Pakistan responded by cutting back on, uh, on the import of Indian uh, manufactured goods. And that created a, f a, a, protection, a protective environment for Pakistani manufacturing to begin. So there is this history. And this history is, and then if you look at the trade numbers uh, in, the, in the paper that I will finally submit, I'll, I'll, I'll show you these trade numbers. Um, we have seen, over the years, we've seen several incidents of sharp cutback in the trade flows between the countries. And it has been a relationship that has been very susceptible to, to political uh, developments between the two countries. And therefore, from the, from the trading community, from the business community, you keep hearing these echoes that if we develop a deep trading relationship across the border, and it, if, it, if it is so subject to political uh, uh, vicissitudes, uh, is that a good supply line to have? Is that a good supply chain to develop? And so this issue comes up over and over again. So the history, history is there, but you know, 20 years ago, um, 15 years ago, um, a, there was a lot of optimism uh, in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan had enjoyed uh, very good growth rates. Uh, uh, a Pakistan had developed uh, it, its infrastructure. Uh, everybody knows that Pakistan has done very poorly when it comes to social indicators, uh, Pakistan's achievements are far below countries at its level of income per capita in terms of education and health outcomes. But what many people don't know is that Pakistan's indicators on infrastructure, such as roads, railways, access to electrification, uh, access to clean drinking water, are far above uh, countries at its level of income per capita. So the initial years where the import substitution industrialization strategy was being implemented was, were also the years when Pakistan 
had become a very prominent member of alliances with the United States, CETO and CENTO, and therefore was a recipient of a large volume of, uh, of official assistance, and that assistance was going largely in infrastructure projects, roads, railways, dams, uh, et cetera. And therefore, a, a, a deregulating uh, economy in many ways, uh, uh, a, 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 pr a protective environment uh, on, the, on the other hand, and with a rapidly modernizing infrastructure, Pakistan was actually able to create for the first time a north-south uh, corridor. Uh, a, a, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words later on on this. A, although Pakistan has had three or four vibrant regions, a, through history, it's never existed as a, as a unit till 47. And, and what has created, what has cemented that one unit is this infrastructure uh, north-south corridor. Um, uh, for the first time, Pakistan, the region which is Pakistan, actually has a market, an indus basin market, where goods and money flow north to south uh, on, this, on this highway of, uh, of uh, communications um, and, and banks, et cetera. Um, so with that uh, uh, and with uh, a series of growth wins, Pakistan had enjoyed growth rates of 6% or more per annum for nearly 30 years. So a lot of uh, optimism, a new entrepreneurial class had been created, uh, sustained high growth, um, a lot of optimism a, till the 80s. After the 80s, Pakistan begins to lose the growth momentum. And we see this uh, in, in this graph. The, the, the dark blue line in pa is, is Pakistan. And you will see that the average growth rate uh, is higher most of the years, right up to the early 80s, uh, right up to the early 90s. And then it is below India's consistently since the early 1990s. Uh, more tellingly, income per capita. Income per, cap capita, per capita higher than India's right up to 2007. Then the line crosses, and now there's a huge divergence. Now, because they are neighbors, they will always compare themselves uh, to each other. Uh, what does that mean? And I'm, I'm happy to reproduce this table here because I like to think that this table changed minds in Pakistani establishment. I mean, it's just a simple off-the-cuff calculation <laughs> done uh, uh, over a cup of tea. Uh, in 2006, uh, Pakistan GDP as a share of India's GDP, 14%. In 2020, with current projections, it'll be 9%. Pakistan GDP per capita as a percentage of India's, almost the same in 2006, it'll be half that of India in 2020. This next, next number is, is, is one that I think uh, that's when the penny dropped. Uh, dollar value of 1% GDP spent on services, and I put, it put in brackets defense also because of the audience that it was targeted at. Uh, a, in India, 2006, uh, 7 billion. 1% means 7 billion. 2020, 1% will mean 22 billion. So it will triple. In Pakistan, 1 billion in 2006, and in 2020, at current growth rates, it'll only double to 2 billion. So a, a, that early optimism uh, has given way to some concern that if we are going to open up our economy, as we did to China 10 years ago, a giant that came and a lot of the small manufacturers uh, were um, were crushed, basically. They couldn't stand up to the competition to, to Chinese manufacturers. So there is this concern, although India is not quite China in terms of manufacturing competitiveness, but there is this concern that here's an economy, a large economy, you, you produce to scale, your costs will be lower, and there'll be much greater competition. And these, this, this recent growth performance hasn't helped uh, uh, in, 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 in restoring that confidence. I'm just presenting this to you as a, as a background 
to understand why, despite all of the analysis showing that there are huge advantages to, to opening up, why there's been this, this pushback and this, this, this concern. Now, I, I had earlier shown you competitiveness indicators. This, this shows you how India's competitiveness has actually has improved considerably in recent years. Uh, the more you, this, this is the happy quadrant. Uh, the, the, the northeast quadrant, the more of your products and the larger your, your, your blobs in those, the better you are, the more competitive you are. And you can see that India is doing very well in pharmaceuticals, in iron and steel chemicals, uh, and Pakistan has only this one chemicals blob in there. Textiles, etc., don't actually fall in that. Uh, so it's a, it's a somewhat different environment. And there are all of these concerns add up to uh, a, the possibility that those who are adversely affected by trade liberalization with India will kick up a fuss. Bilateral trade balances shouldn't matter. You know, everybody who's worth their salt, as economists tell you, it doesn't matter what you have on the bilateral trade balance. What matters is the overall trade balance. But the politics of bilateral trade balances is, is amazing. It happens even in the in, in very developed, uh, advanced economies. Uh, somehow, journalists just 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 hang on to the bilateral trade balance. And if the bilateral trade balance uh, uh, deteriorates, uh, there will be an issue. There will be people who who are who are currently feel weak, who will get adversely affected, and will kick up a fuss. Now, what do you do that? What what do you do? How do you deal with? How do you address this issue? There is this historical concern that India-Pakistan trade is susceptible to, politi to, 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 to political ups and downs. There is this weak competitiveness, a sense, a perceived sense in Pakistan that there's, there's weak uh, uh, a, a competitiveness has suffered in recent years. Um, so, so how do you put confidence back so that when when somebody makes a shrill noise that, look, things are taking a turn for the worst, let's put an end to this opening. Uh, how do you address that? And what I've been trying to argue is that you have to see bilateral trade in the context of the larger regional development until you begin to reimagine South Asia region and Pakistan's position in the South Asia region. Uh, you will always remain susceptible to India-Pakistan uh, more shorter-term concerns. And everybody needs to reimagine uh, the region, but I think uh, the onus on Pakistan is, is, is the greatest because Pakistan is likely to be the, the greatest beneficiary of, uh, of a strategy that, that looks at its position in the region as that of an economic hub rather than the thinking that has dom been dominate, the dominant thinking in the last uh, several decades, that it somehow needs to have territorial disputes and engage in territorial disputes across its borders. Now, a, a, an important reason why uh, a, one can make this argument today is that, a, you see, it didn't matter that you were not trading with India 20 years ago, because India was mired in what the Indian economists called the Hindu growth rate of three, three and a half percent. It was inward looking, and it didn't matter that you were not trading. Uh, China was in a long slumber. Um, not, things didn't start to move in, in China till the 80s, late 70s, 80s, and it didn't matter that you were not trading across your northeastern border. Uh, Central Asia was part of the Soviet empire, and again, it didn't matter. But today, that, that world has changed. Uh, and India, China is no lo not, not just the China of the Pacific coast. China is now very actively engaged economically in Western China, and Western China is right across the border from Pakistan. Uh, so that's a billion-person eco economy growing at 8 9%. To the east, another billion-person economy growing at 7 to 8%. Central Asia, out of the Soviet clutches, huge energy uh, uh, reserves, 
want to engage with labor surplus uh, and savings uh, rich economies uh, to the east. Um, uh, the view of on Iran I know is different in Washington, but those who live there, they have to look at Iran from a longer term perspective because Iran is there, you, we can't wish it away. Um, and, and therefore, a, in, and in, Iran also has a huge uh, uh, energy reserves. And Pakistan is sitting right in the middle of that. And without engaging with India, you don't really become a hub. You are a T-junction. <laughs> You're not a crossroads. And the, the, uh, the, the, the increased activity as a result of being the crossroads will be much larger than if you were to just say, we will, trade, we will deal with Central Asia, we'll deal with China, and we'll not deal with India. So I think, I think understanding the economic geography of where you are uh, will go a long way in, uh, in changing perceptions. And, uh, and I've used this argument in all kinds of places in Pakistan. It's beginning to resonate, uh, resonate very well. The other, the other important argument is, a, is one about national integrity, uh, national integration, rather, in Pakistan. You see, before 47, uh, even earlier, um, this region never really existed as one integrated uh, polity. Uh, and yet it has had a huge influence on South Asia culturally. Um, a couple of recent books that have been written by historians, uh, they trace the impact of, uh, of this region. Basically, there were three vibrant regions in what is now Pakistan. You have Peshawar in the north, Lahore and Multan in the middle, and Upper Sindh. And these regions were really uh, trading across. They were, they were connecting markets. They were connecting markets in the east with markets to the west. And as a result of connecting those markets, they became centers of culture, centers of commerce, growth nodes, and, uh, and, and, and that explains why these centers have had such a huge impact on, 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 uh, on South Asia as a whole. For a variety of reasons, uh, uh, post-colonial era, uh, starting 19th century, the Western the Western connections were cut off. Uh, Anglo-Russian Anglo, uh, rivalry created uh, a buffer state, uh, and then Soviet Union, and similarly, uh, the Iran. Th but there was enough going on with connections to the East so that they retained their vibrancy. After 47, they were completely cut off. They, they were cut off both from the western and the east, uh, the western and the eastern markets, and this is where the north south. That's why north south trade corridor was so important in giving vibrancy for three decades. But what what I'm arguing is that that north south corridor has lost its. It's done what it could do, and now, without recreating these east west connections, you won't get the kind of growth that you got in the first uh, in the first thirty years, and. So this is a sort of a, a historical argument, not just the geography, but also the historical argument uh, makes it extremely important for Pakistan to think of itself as a hub, as a connector of markets, uh, rather than uh, just the north-south uh, market uh, that it has had for a while. Now, what will it take uh, to get there? Uh, I think imagining the region differently is very important. And, and I think that started to happen. Um, but uh, a, a, okay, I mean, clearly bilateral trade with India is, uh, at, but beyond bilateral trade, right, it has to be a, a full-fledged economic relationship that Pakistan and India need to move towards, which means uh, exchange of technology, it means exchange of, uh, it means uh, investment flows, uh, it means uh, skills flows uh, across the borders. And hopefully uh, it means uh, setting up joint ventures uh, uh, across the borders. So a full-fledged economic relationship. Uh, Pakistan will need to invest 
in modernizing its infrastructure in these three or four hubs, which are the vibrant uh, hubs of Pakistan. So a lot of infrastructure uh, investment will be needed. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, uh, in Pakistan, people talk about the demographic dividend. Uh, and I think without um, <coughs> upgrading the education <coughs> system, uh, getting more enrollments in the, at the primary level, but also improving the quality of higher education, uh, you're not going to get that demographic dividend. So if, if, if Pakistan invests in education, uh, if Pakistan in, invests in upgrading the infrastructure in these three hubs and the north-south corridor, and if Pakistan a, maintains a broader economic relationship with India, I think this will create, the region will create a growth wind for Pakistan, which will give high growth for the next 30, 40 years of the growth of the sort that Pakistan enjoyed in the past. Um, so what is, uh, I, and I'm just about to finish, uh, what is India's role in all this? Um, um, I think India too needs to look at, uh, develop a regional perspective. Uh, on these issues, uh, just just an India-focused view of the world um, is great, but uh, but I think uh, uh, the countries will go along uh, a lot further with India if India begins to develop a regional perspective. Um, and this is not just on trade and economic relations, but on water issues as, as well. Um, a, Extremely important that uh, this opening is accompanied by a liberalization of the visa regime uh, because in the absence of that, only large businesses will benefit. Businesses that can set up offices in uh, Dubai and Singapore and, and, and Karachi and Mumbai. Uh, a, given, <coughs> given the susceptibility of this relationship to be um, uh, to be effect, adversely affected, uh, it's very important that small businesses benefit from this opening up. And small businesses will not benefit in the current extremely uh, tight uh, visa regime. Um, it's also going to be extremely important that uh, trade facilitation be improved by both India and Pakistan. Uh, but uh, in India in, in, in particular, uh, because uh, poor trade facilitation, poor infrastructure should not become a reason for what people say are essentially non-tariff barriers, um, because I, that can put a spanner in the works very quickly. Um, and above all, I think, uh, uh, given the history of the trade relationship between these two countries, um, a, India must not use uh, a collective punishment as a way to to address uh, the problems uh, that that will happen from time to time, given the long-standing disputes between India and Pakistan. That is all. Well, thank you, uh, Ijaz, for getting us off to a really good start. Uh, we've had a great deal of discussion about Pakistan, but until the last three or four minutes, uh, not much attention to India, which, if I understand the basics of trades, trade, you need two parties. Um, so uh, we'll now uh, turn to Arvind Brahmani, who will look at some of these same issues from an Indian perspective. Uh, again, you have Dr. Romani's uh, bio in front of you, so I will simply uh, remind you that he is executive director at the IMF uh, here in town. He is also affiliated with George Mason University. Um, he has had very senior positions um, in uh, advising the Indian government for something on the order of 25 years. Uh, before being asked to come, uh, being asked by Delhi to come to Washington to represent uh, India at the IMF uh, a couple years ago. Uh, Arvind, we are delighted to have you with us. We look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Oops, is this on? Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's useful uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to take a couple of minutes. Uh, 
uh, the, uh, there was supposed to be another speaker at this, and I uh, offered my services, but I was very clear that, you know, I've been out of this issue for at least two and a half years, so my comments are very general. And uh, really, my perspective is, uh, the, uh, as he mentioned, uh, 20 years of involvement in, in issues of trade tariffs, uh, tax policy in India. Uh, just as an example, uh, I, I was actually a member of the study group on the Indo-Chinese FTA. So uh, it's really my whole background, which is why I agreed uh, to, to uh, talk about this. Uh, the the, t uh, the uh, topic was for originally titled Business View. As I, as I said, that I, I really don't know what the current business view is, but I have the broad, you know, as old perspective, so I don't feel bad because you had a study which was fairly old. <laughs> so what is the uh, business view? I'll briefly start with that and then go on to some broader issues from my experience uh, of uh, reform of trade and tariff policy, as, as I said, I've been deeply involved in those in India. Uh, so my general perception of Indian business on this issue is that business is quite sanguine, and most are very positive about this issue. And I think it's important to understand why, and that's what I'm really going to talk about uh, before I go on to other issues. Uh, one is the reform experience uh, in India f uh, in the 1990s on both uh, trade and tariff. Uh, just to give a sense of uh, what this means to those of you who have not followed, uh, peak tariffs uh, on manufacturing in, in the 1990s were 250 percent. By the 2000s, they were down to 10 percent. In the 1990s, virtually everything for the general economy had QRs in it. Uh, and by, uh, uh, by 2000, it was all gone as far as manufacturers are concerned. I'm talking here of manufacturers. So uh, what is the experience? Uh, uh, a story, uh, uh, which I sometimes tell, kind of highlights it. Uh, there used to be uh, uh, something uh, you've probably not heard of. It's called dead burnt magnesia. This was one of the big industrialists in India who, from the time of the reforms, every time before the budget, he would come and see me and say, we will die uh, if you reduce this tariff further. He came for five years continuously. He came to see me every time before the budget. And then he no longer came. So I was wondering, did he disappear? <laughs> well, some years later, I read in the newspapers that dead burnt magnesia, he's still there. <laughs> he's still manufacturing dead burnt magnesia. So the moral of that story is, uh, it turns out uh, that we all thought, or not, I did not, uh, because I was involved in the policy. And I hoped and expected that that's what would happen. But 99% of the people in India thought in the Indian industry would die. They would not be able to compete, and they did very effectively. So that is one of the main reasons why uh, Indian industry uh, is not apprehensive uh, about uh, uh, this issue. Secondly, I think uh, in, uh, in the states bordering uh, Pakistan, for example, Punjab, uh, there's kind of an old memory, at least among <coughs> the older people around my age or older. Uh, about pre-1960s, and, you know, there were things happening, and, you know, people traded across the border. There was no border in, in the, uh, before 1947. And so the issue of uh, local, uh, what one might call local and provincial uh, comparative advantage, you know, those of us who uh, think of national issues often tend to forget that. Uh, there is a local economy, there's local interaction, and, and there are still people uh, in the Indian Punjab, at least, and uh, hopefully in, in uh, Pakistani Punjab, who still remember. And one uh, way to put this more starkly is that even though Punjab is the agricultural state in India, uh, there is small industry, and they've been competing with Haryana, Delhi, Western UP uh, for decades. So again, uh, uh, there, there is this feeling that, yes, there will be uh, adjustments, uh, but uh, if you are alert, uh, you can find your comparative advantage. So uh, uh, that's uh, this part of the business view, uh, the reasons uh, why they are not apprehensive, by and large. Uh, the second point I want to touch on very briefly uh, is, is, uh, uh, is on global experience. And this is also important, uh, is that uh, there is now enough uh, research 
uh, which shows uh, that uh, uh, about growth poles uh, from Latin America and other places uh, that a high growth economy uh, in effect has a positive effect on the growth of its neighbors. Now, of course, this is not absolute, and it depends critically on interconnectedness, but I'll come to that briefly. But let me tell you a little about growth in Asia, uh, in, in South Asia, uh, and not just India. Uh, I have recently completed for, uh, an update of my study on high growth economies, and some of you may find this very interesting. It turns out that one of the fastest growing economies in the world was Bhutan from 1982 to 97. There have been only 20 such economies in the world in the historical period for which data is available to me. And Bhutan was one of them. Because of one investment, which is India. Well, we will, <laughs> uh, you are familiar with it. We can discuss it. It has to do with hydropower. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, uh, and the second one, again, which may surprise you, was Myanmar in 1990 to 2008. Now, of course, currently, it turns out there are only five uh, what I call high growth or potentially high growth economies in the world, and one of them happens to be India, of course. So uh, the point here is not uh, India or Bhutan or Myanmar. The point is growth poles have an effect on neighbors, and that brings us to interconnectedness. Obviously, a necessary condition is that you be connected. Otherwise, you cannot benefit from that growth pole, whatever it is. Uh, and of course, again, we've talked a lot about the soft uh, part of it, tariffs and QRs, and uh, Ijaz has also mentioned uh, infrastructure uh, and highways. You need the connections, unless, uh, otherwise you cannot have the benefits. Now, one of the thoughts which came to me is that perhaps in developing uh, this interconnectedness in terms of infrastructure, uh, we could think of PPP and business participation so that the interest is widened both on both sides, uh, both on the Pakistani side and the Indian side, to do some of this in a PPP mode so that a wide uh, segment of business uh, benefits, not just the government in a sense. Uh, I move on to my third point, which actually has been kind of covered by Jaws, but what, what the point I want to make here is, is, is that uh, it's, it's very important uh, for those uh, who, who have a positive view of these things to, to do research on and look for and publicize the positive things which will come out of it. Because the negative is always taken up by the press, as, as you well know, and we've seen that all the time in India and every country, including the US, <laughs> while I've been here for two and a half years. Uh, the negatives will always be blown up. So it's very important uh, to find the positive and just make them known. It's not a question of biasing it, it's just having the facts known to everybody so that they can make informed judgments. So for example, the first thing of course you should see, and Ijaz has pointed this out, that there's a pure deadweight loss from all the trade which is going through third countries. When it shifts back, you should see a visible improvement because this is going to be a shared benefit. It is absolutely clear that both sides will benefit from it because there's a huge deadweight loss involved in taking it uh, from other places. Uh, and, and we should be looking out for that and publicizing it. The second uh, lesson I want to uh, bring out, uh, besides the growth poll experience, which I've uh, studied a lot, uh, is the Indo-Sri Lanka FTA. And here, uh, again, it's, it's useful to uh, uh, mention uh, uh, that uh, for three years, I was uh, running a think tank. I was head of a thing called ICRIAR, which uh, you'll have somebody else from there now speaking uh, after lunch, uh, but one of the studies we undertook, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Amita Batra, actually did that growth poll uh, study when I was there. Uh, it, it was one of, part of our program. Uh, uh, so, so we also uh, looked uh, carefully at uh, my colleagues. I mean, I, I was just the director. I didn't do the studies. Uh, at the Indo-Sri Lanka, I think uh, Nisha was involved in that, yes. Uh, Indo-Sri Lanka FTA uh, and the subsequent discussions on SEPA and uh, 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 on my visits to, to Sri Lanka, I always ask the businessmen uh, that I met, uh, but let me tell you uh, the perspective here. There are two things. Uh, the, first, the second one is what I learned from the businessmen. The first one I actually saw, uh, and that is uh, what I would call the reduction elimination of trade diversion. Uh, just one example. Uh, uh, I was struck by the number of uh, Tata trucks on, on, uh, on Sri Lankan roads. 
And in a way, that's not surprising because uh, Tata beat the Japanese manufacturers in India uh, uh, in open competition with this reduction in QRs and tariffs. And the reason was because they are more suited to the in Indian road conditions uh, and, and the general conditions in which they are maintained. The whole structure is different from what it is in, in West. So uh, uh, again, the point here is that one has to be careful. What you will see is this change, but you should not see that as a loss to Pakistan because the losers are really the Japanese or whoever else. Uh, so it's very important to be clear about that. And the second one, which uh, I learned from the uh, uh, Sri Lankan businessmen, was that it allowed them to have a certain amount of economies of scale so they could test their products, for example, in Sri Lanka, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and so one of the things they told me was their expansion into Tamil Nadu. Uh, for example, tea, uh, uh, you know, 20 years ago, you would never uh, think of having Sri Lankan tea in India because we were one of the biggest uh, exporters and producers of tea. Now you do see that. So what they've done is they've uh, uh, moved into Sri, uh, Tamil Nadu first uh, and, and, and uh, established their brand names. So it really gives an opportunity for a smaller country to uh, test uh, its markets and develop a little bit of scale, which then allows you to go out and compete in a culturally different market. So these are two things uh, uh, which I would suggest that uh, Pakistanis have, have to be aware of and, and see how they can use. Now, in the case of Sri Lanka, just uh, by the way, but it could apply to Pakistan too, the, uh, they also use tourism very effectively. Uh, so Indian tourism to uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, that's just a, an aside. But the point is that you have to be open to opportunities. You have to have a positive attitude, uh, which is what Ajaz has also been saying. Just finally, then, the, my last point uh, is uh, on, on uh, new initiatives. Uh, I, I agree completely with uh, uh, Ijaz, uh, and uh, let me put it in two different ways, one which he hasn't mentioned. Uh, I think uh, any next steps, because uh, w would I, I think it will be useful now to what I would call re-energize SAFTA, the South, uh, South Asian Free Trade Agreement, because for a long time, uh, there was a constraint, and, and that was normal Indo-Pakistan trade. Once that happens, it's really, uh, uh, that lays the foundation for looking at that again. And so uh, I would just like to bring that to everybody's attention who is involved in this, because I think you could make big gains uh, in that, and it also provides a political cover, in a sense, uh, to whoever is opposed, you know, uh, to those who are in favor uh, uh, versus those who are opposed in principle uh, to this trade. SAFTA, in a way, provides the cover uh, for, for doing this. And part of it is exactly what uh, Ijaz said, is to convert South Asia into a crossroads. But again, I think in principle that could be tied to SAFTA. So SAFTA as a crossroads, uh, not only uh, to Central Asia, but also to Southeast Asia. Uh, it could work uh, uh, both ways. So uh, I would say that's, in a way, uh, could be uh, the next, uh, besides uh, what I said, of identifying the gains uh, uh, from trade which will happen, uh, to identify how one could move forward in making South Asia as a crossroads uh, to Central Asia uh, and Southeast Asia. Uh, let me stop with that. Uh, sorry, I should just mention that, uh, that there's the big change, of course, now, as probably most of you know, is Myanmar is coming out of isolation. So it's actually a, a very good opportunity to do this. Thank you. Thank you, um, Arvin. Um, it now gives me particular pleasure to introduce our next speaker for the simple reason that he's an old friend. Um, uh, Dr. Ishrad Hussein has spoken here on a number of occasions. Um, he has contributed and participated in two of our earlier uh, conferences that we've hosted with Fellowship Fund for Pakistan. Um, Ishrad Hussain is now Dean and Director of the Institute of Business Administration in Karachi, um, one of, uh, like LUMS, uh, one of uh, Pakistan's most distinguished institutions. Um, he was, for a number of years, governor of the State Bank of Pakistan. Uh, earlier in his career, he um, had held senior positions at the World Bank, 
Um, Israt, we are delighted to welcome you back to the Wilson Center and look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Bob. It's a uh, pleasure to see so many friends and old faces here. Uh, I've been assigned um, a difficult task, which is to present the descending views, although this runs contrary to my own personal and professional views, but because I have been a very strong advocate of India-Pakistan trade for a very long time. I started going to India in 1980, and I've been going there since then, sometimes four or five times a year. And as a student of India-Pakistan economy, I did two papers, one in 1994, which showed that um, among all the comparative indicators, economic and social at that time, Pakistan was way ahead of India. And recently I did a paper which showed that during the last 20 years, as Ajaz pointed out, India has actually overtaken uh, Pakistan in almost all indicators, both economic as well as social. And that was an eye-opener for some of us who have been advocating a resumption of the trading and economic relations with our next door neighbor. And the reason why there has been uh, a kind of rethinking about this topic is the realization that we are sitting um, across two big giants, and this is the Asian century, and we are not taking advantage of our particular geostrategic location. On the east, uh, we have India, and on the west, we have China. And we are not taking advantage of this real location. And if there was any other country for the last 20 years, uh, they would have benefited from this particular you know, advantage. My first uh, encounter was a disaggregated six-digit study which the research department of the State Bank carried out in 2004, which showed that at that time the volume of trade was $1 billion between the two countries. And doing almost nothing, um, this volume could have multiplied five times to five billion with equal benefits to both the countries, two and a half to uh, India and two and a half billions to, to Pakistan. I just did a paper for Atlantic Council, which uh, is available, where we revisited, I think, as I agree with uh, HRs, that the bilateral trade now, if it opens up a full blast, would be more beneficial uh, towards India because India has uh, developed a comparative advantage uh, because of the economies of the scale, because of the technological progress, because of uh, the raw materials which uh, are available in certain areas. So when this MFN status came, the Ministry of Commerce approached the IBA Karachi to carry out some analytical work, and we did the revealed <coughs> comparative advantage for switching from the positive list to the negative list. And we submitted to the cabinet uh, a list of 569 uh, items, which could be on the negative list out of 12 uh, um, 8,000 items, which was almost 15%. But after some compromises, this uh, list was expanded to 1,200, which is still much better situation than the positive list, which covered only 25% uh, and now 15%, and now this opens <coughs> up 75% of the trade between India and Pakistan. And by December. Uh, this will also be phased out, and there will be no negative list, and the MFN status uh, would be uh, complete at that particular point of time. 
The Ministry of Commerce asked us to carry out focus groups discussions with the major stakeholders in the industry. And we engaged with the automobile, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and textile set sectors at Karachi and Lahore during early 2012. So this is more recent. And they gave us a list, which is going to be available in my paper, of the non-tariff barriers which India has against Pakistani exports, which have been identified by the actual experience of these industries. Uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, technical barriers to trade, quotas and import licenses on 600 items, aggressive use of safeguard and anti-dumping measures, frequent invocation of countervailing duties, stringent license requirements on the Bureau of Indian Standards, multiple custom clearance requirements, non-standard custom valuation methodology, stringent and lengthy certification requirements, restrictions on rail movements of goods, complicated and restrictive visa requirements, long dwell times at ports and border points, transit restrictions, absence of testing labs at the border crossing points, state government's restriction on use, sale, and consumption of certain goods, uncertainty about interstate movement of goods, and non-acceptance of letters of credit issued by Pakistani banks. These were the concerns shown by the uh, members of the focus groups. But as uh, Ajaz pointed out, there's an overwhelming support for uh, liberalization of the trade with India, although the uh, momentum uh, of trade uh, is going to, to depend on a number of retaliatory measures, or what I would call as the promotional measures which the Indian government will take in order to remove some of these barriers. We argued that these are not the barriers which are peculiar to uh, Pakistan. These are the barriers which are applicable to all um, imports from the third uh, parties. So this is not a Pakistan specific, but because of the trust deficit for a very long time, uh, I would argue that India has to go and bend backwards in order to allay these fears of the Pakistani industry to establish its credentials that it is really very sincere in opening up the trade. And my calculations show that at the best estimates which Ikrir had done and I had done and I think others have done, Indian imports will be affected at the best to 3%, between 2 to 3%, which is totally negligible. If even the volume of Pakistani exports multiplies five times, this is the max which India would be able to import from Pakistan. But the reason why I am arguing this is that strong economic relations would create constituencies in both the countries. For Pakistan, the businessmen will become the constituency for the Indian, for India, and Indian businessmen who are doing trade with Pakistan will become the constituency for Pakistan and India, and this will also help in the resolution of the political disputes. After all, uh, Taiwan and China, Japan and China have had many political disputes, but the trade between these two countries, and even China and India have uh, boundary disputes, but the China-India trade is now close to $60 billion. So same argument we are using in Pakistan, that we cannot abandon our political disputes. You continue with the composite dialogue, but don't make trade and economic cooperation 
as the hostage to your political disputes. You carry this on on multiple tracks. And this liberalization of trade will eventually build up very favorable climate for the resolution of the political disputes also. I would not go into each one of the concerns of the pharma, of the agriculture, or automotive and chemicals and synthetic fibers, uh, which are I have documented in this paper. But I identified in this study what I consider are eight risks for managing, and the paper's title is Managing India-Pakistan Trade. And my major emphasis is that this is a sapling. And this sapling has to be nurtured. It has to be given water. It has to be treated with tender care so that it grows in a tree. But there are too many obstacles and constraints in the way of this sapling becoming a tree. And this risk mitigation and a more proactive treatment by both governments is very essential, especially in the transition period. And the first risk is that this is a huge trade deficit between the two countries, which I don't have to deal with. And my worry is that there is a fear that any unforeseen or unplanned contingency can trigger a strong adverse reaction on the other side. If there is another terrorist attack on India and Pakistan is blamed, I think the X will fall on trade. And the trade will either be disrupted or a lot of restrictions will be put. So I quote Mani Shankar Iyer, a very prominent Indian uh, politician, who says that both the dialogue process and trade relations should continue uninterrupted and uninterrupted at that point of time. And I believe in that, that at the time of the crisis, the policy of engagement rather than abrupt withdrawal would prove to be more effective in diffusing the situation and finding an amicable resolution to the problem. Our history is that we completely cut down all ties and we stop talking to each other like the children do. There is a more mature behavioral kind of action, which is that at that time, you talk and continue to engage in dialogue so that you find a solution to the problem which is contrary to what has been happening. So the knee-jerk reaction, which both countries have been guilty of in the past, has to be avoided, which is easier said than done. But in order to continue with the trading relations, it is very important. The businessmen on both sides, I was in Delhi and Hyderabad last week. And the businessmen on both sides say that establishing relationship with our counterparts on the other side takes time. It is not that just by signing the agreement and removing these uh, negative list to the positive list would spark a lot of activity. It is a gradual process. And if we are not sure that this process is going to last, then the trading volumes will not take off. Therefore, there is a need for predictability, continuity, and consistency in the policies of both the governments. So this, to me, is the critical message which I want to uh, share with this audience. The second risk is that there are political parties in both the countries 
which are behaving in op a different way when they are in opposition. When BJP and Mr. Vajpayee were great supporters of India-Pakistan trade, but when they get into the opposition, then they have a different tune. And similarly in Pakistan, just to have point scoring against the ruling party, they get together with the extremist elements on both sides. And that's my fear that the political parties on both sides may join hands, create a political backlash on the bilateral trade imbalances. This is one of the fears that if there is a trade imbalance in favor of India, the political parties in Pakistan may behave irresponsibly and there may be a political backlash. So this has to be uh, completely uh, reckoned with and realized that we should get away from the metrics of trade balances between the bilateral countries. We still have a very large imbalance against China, and that's going to happen with India also. But the focus should shift from this metric of the trade imbalance. The third uh, risk, in my view, arises from the activities of the losers lobby. There are bound to be losers and winners out of this liberalization of trade, both sides. And it is quite possible that while traders and importers in both countries are going to be very happy because their businesses are going to expand, but the inefficient manufacturing firms will be the losers from this liberalization. And they may lo lobby the government and the political parties by making noises that this onslaught of imports, or which are quite cheap from the other side, is destroying domestic industry and jobs. This identification of a larger problem of the country, which it already faces, with this very narrow parochial lobbyist views is a source of risk at this point of time. If we were growing like we were doing between 2002 to 2007 by 7.5% and unemployment was going down, I would not consider this to be a major risk. But when we are in a low level equilibrium, this is something which we have to worry about. The fourth is the media and civil society in both countries have become very powerful. And I think that the media has to be, have some stories which provide the positive fallout of the trade. If some small and medium enterprises are shutting down because of the influx of the goods from the other side, that will play in the hands of these irresponsible people and will be propagated uh, through the media, which is really going to create problems for the governments in both the countries. So frequent exchanges between the representatives of the media, holding of seminars, meetings, roundtables between the civil uh, society organizations can really be very helpful. And the Advertisement, particularly the commercials, should be shown on both countries' media because that is creating a vested interest in uh, the trade regime. The fifth uh, risk which I see is that there are um, procurement of certain goods from the other side, uh, which is for Pakistan, for example, if you bring in the textile machinery, components, and uh, the uh, parts from India, this will actually reduce the cost of production for Pakistani textile owners. 
and then they can penetrate the Indian market. But if this cost of production is perceived on the other side, in Indian side or the vice versa in the Pakistan side, as something which is really going to harm the local industry and artificial quantitative restrictions or other non-tariff barriers are created, then in the long run, this trade volumes are going to be affected adversely. So in the beginning, let us try to manage this whole transition in a very not neglectful, but in a more informed manner and look at the consequences very carefully, take the remedial actions. The other um, area is the composite dialogue. I don't want the losers and the extremist elements to say, look, this is a lollipop which has been given out to keep us away from the core issues and from our political disputes. So it is very necessary that the composite dialogue, which I personally think that both sides are very much keen to continue, and there couldn't be a better regime than Mr. Manmohan Singh as a prime minister in India, who is very sincerely committed to normalized, trades with, uh, normalized relations with Pakistan, and Mr. Zardari on Pakistan's side, who is also equally keen, this is an opportunity where the composite dialogue uh, should make some tangible progress. Get rid of some of the minor issues like Siachen and Sir Creek and others, so that there are some runs on the board which will solidify and also reinforce the economic relations. The seventh uh, point is that there is a need for subcontracting in some areas. And I remember the TCS coming to Pakistan in 2004 and saying, look, we get a lot of orders from the West for our IT business outsourcing. But at the lower end, we are finding that our wages are going up. So can we set up these R&D centers in Lahore and we will train your IT specialist and carry out the work under our contract as a subcontractor. If you do that, you're actually doing a great favor to solidify the trading relations because you have a tangible employment and job creation for the educated youth in Pakistan, where you will be able to demonstrate that's not only the trade which is really helping the country, but also the economic cooperation with India is creating jobs. And TCS, Wipro, Infosys feel that there is so much work which can be let out to Pakistan that there will be a big boost as far as the IT industry in Pakistan is concerned. Similarly, um, you have other areas, for example, um, agriculture. Now, BT cotton, for example, is something which has revolutionized the Indian cotton industry from 17 million bales. They have doubled it to 34 million in very few years because they adopted the BT cotton. Now there is a smuggling of BT cotton seeds across the border, but there is no concerted effort in order to do it in a systematic and scientific manner. Now if you bring in from Haryana and from Eastern Punjab, the same BT uh, varieties and disseminate that in Pakistan, the cotton industry in Pakistan, which is, which is only 14 million bales right now, can double to 28 million bales. And so this is a very, again, a perceptible 
and visible manifestation of the larger economic cooperation and the gains and the benefits are quite visible. <coughs> and finally, I argue that there will be disputes between the trading parties and there will be need for arbitration and dispute resolution. But having been part of the bureaucracy and having many friends in Indian bureaucracy, which Arvind and I know very well, I don't think we should entrust this dispute resolution to the bureaucracy. <laughs> we should give it to the Confederation of Indian Industries and FIKI on the India side and Pakistan Business Council and the FPCCI on Pakistan side. They are sensible people because their, their interests are at stake and they will come to a more amicable solution to this problem. So the whole policy recommendations chapter of my paper is really elaboration of the actions which need to be taken by both the countries in order to mitigate these risks and allow this sapling to become a robust tree. So as I said, managing transition. And I also think very uh, sincerely, and I've told this to my friends, uh, at least the Commerce Secretary and the DG Foreign Trade both happen to be from Boston University, where I also went, so we have something in common, and I told them that, look, the voluntary export restraint may be a tool which India can use if they find that there is too much of, you know, influx in the first year of the Indian goods into the Pakistani markets. And voluntary export restraints will act as a break Eventually, they can be removed. So how do you manage uh, this relationship uh, is extremely important, especially in the first uh, or uh, uh, second year. The technical barriers to trade and sanitary and phytosanitary measures are really acting as powerful deterrent to the exchange of goods. And I think both sides have to work together and one of the agreement which has been signed recently is that the standards of both the countries should be harmonized. And once it has been harmonized, then the certification by one standard agency will be applicable to the other country's goods also. As uh, Ajaz very rightly pointed out, visa restrictions have to be eased out. I mean, you cannot have two track visa regimes. All the big businesses are able to go to India anytime they want without any police reporting, without any hindrance to go to multiple cities. But the small and the medium businesses are facing enormous difficulties. Now, if you really want to win over these small and medium enterprises who are quite nimble as compared to the big one, and because of the proximity between the two borders, they can create a lot of goodwill on both sides through the transactions, there must be a liberal visa regime. The Ministry of External Affairs and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Pakistan are working on it, but the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Interior are still not very much convinced about that. So that, to me, is something which is very, very important. And I think I agree with Erwin that the sooner we reactivate the SAFTA and agree on the phasing out of the sensitive list, which is still a part of India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Now, India and Sri Lanka have entered into an FTA. So that sensitive list vis-a-vis -vis Sri Lanka is totally inoperative. But there is a sensitive list 
between India and Pakistan under SAFTA. And I heard in Delhi that perhaps India will reduce the list by 30 percent uh, by December. So that will be a very important move in order to look at beyond December 2012 regime, whereby the lower are the items included in the sensitive list, the larger is the horizon for the exchange of goods and services. Governor Reddy and myself uh, signed an agreement in 2005, whereby we said that two banks of India can open branches in Pakistan, and two in Pakistani banks can open the branches in India. That agreement has not been implemented, and I cannot conceive of any trading relationship unless you have letters of credit, you have cross-border transfer of funds, and trade will not take place. So there is a need to implement that particular agreement very quickly. And I'm very happy that uh, last week the Indian and Pakistani Commerce Ministers inaugurated the integrated cross-bordering uh, area, which can carry 10 times more uh, trucks as compared to what is happening right now with the Waga Atari. But there's a need for opening new border crossings. It's not only through Waga and Atari. There is a Monabau and Kokrapar on the Rajasthan and Sindh. And these are backward areas of both the countries. And I can assure you, before 1965, these were like uh, Arvind was saying, these were really magnets for economic activities across the borders. And the people on both sides were actually benefiting <coughs> from this. So we cannot have just one particular crossing. We have to open up other crossings also. Uh, finally, as a friend of India, I think India has a lot of progressive entrepreneurs, eminent intellectuals, scientists, innovators, globally uh, competitive human resources. But behind the borders, barriers are enormous. And it is in the India's interest to become a major trading partner. India and China started with $10 billion of exports in 1980. Today, China is 1,200 to 1,400 billion, and India is struggling with 300 billion. This is not something which India cannot do, but the behind the border barriers, particularly created by the Indian bureaucracy, are enormous. So my advice is that they should try to dismantle these behind the barrier Border, uh, border barriers and liberalize the movement of goods and services. If it takes 16 hours from one state to another to cross the borders because there are too many formalities and paperwork which has to be done, then it really is retarding the progress of uh, trade uh, liberalization, not with Pakistan, but overall. And finally, I think I would emphasize that the tourism uh, between the two countries, particularly uh, the religious tourism, because there are a lot of Sikhs who have their shrines in the other side, and there are a lot of uh, Muslims who want to go to uh, the shrines in the other uh, side, which is in India. If you allow the, this exchange of people at the ordinary uh, level, this will also build the confidence, uh, which will eventually help diffuse both the political situation, but also build the constituencies for both the countries. So that, I thought, was uh, the gist of my own intervention as to how we can maintain this on a sustained basis, rather than have a flip and flop kind of relations between the two countries, which has happened during the last 60 years. Thank you very much. So, so where's the dissent? 
<laughs> no, that's he what said, I... Yeah, he started. <laughs> I said that this is the non-tariff barriers because of the focus groups, and we have to keep that in mind, that if you don't take care of those uh, concerns of the focus groups of the Pakistani businessmen, that was a dissenting uh, view, which I was asked by Bob to uh, <laughs> present here, and I have done this as faithfully, but it's more... Uh, discussed here in the paper, which is managing India-Pakistan trade. So you will get more meat in there rather than what I uh, had the time uh, at my disposal. Well, you also mentioned, uh, Ishrat, what I thought was a very nice phrase, the loser's lobby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it seems apparent that there is a widespread consensus in both countries and within the business communities of both countries um, that this makes sense um, to go forward with. With that um, sort of as the background, I'm, I'm going to put the first question on the table. Um, what's the, pr and I'm going to direct this to each of our three speakers, um, what's the single greatest impediment um, the two countries face in not simply operationalizing this political decision to move forward, uh, but actually to give it substance so that it moves forward rapidly and in a mutually productive way. What do you worry about and what needs to be done to uh, diffuse this particular problem? Ijaz, we'll ask you first. Well, <coughs> you know, maybe all, all three speakers, uh, including me, uh, you've, you've listed our points of difficulty. But uh, to me, the two most important uh, aspects would be if there is no uh, banking system which, uh, which finances the deals on both sides, this will remain a wish. So having, uh, having banks operate effectively on both sides so that uh, deals can actually be financed uh, is critical. And I really think that uh, the visa regime is a, is a very important factor. I think in Pakistan to uh, diffuse any negative fallout from this, you need to involve the very people who will be the source of that negative fallout, which is a small businessman. And small businessmen will only benefit if they can create business opportunities for themselves, and for that they need the visa re regime. Without that, it won't happen. Thank you. Uh, Arvind, what do you worry about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I thought there was a, a recent agreement on business visas, but I, I don't know how deep no, that small is. Small businessman. No. Okay. Um, Really, the the only uh, impediment uh, uh, is one of his, uh, uh, you know, these eight, um, eight, I think it yeah. was. Uh, I would say my greatest concern would be that one connected with uh, terrorist uh, attack, uh, because in some ways that is the most difficult for the uh, people who who want uh, better relations, including trade. And in some ways, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's got tied to the the visa because our home ministry has become very powerful uh, because of that. So, uh, so these two together is really the the part which we have to kind of work on. Ishrat, you gave us eight very good uh, li a list of eight very good. Would you single out one? <laughs> I think it's the it's the mindset of the customs, standards, other officials who are actually facilitating trade. Uh, their mindset is still very suspicious of each other. Rather than facilitating, they are restricting the movement of people as well as goods. If you do not see any change in the mindset and level of trust between these two uh, developing, then some of the new businesses who are venturing into this area will just give up and say, hey guys, this is beyond us, we are not going to do it. What you require right now is an asymmetric relationship between India and Pakistan, where India being so big, it is eight times bigger economy to say we will 
try to facilitate as much because the non-tariff barriers is an issue which really haunts uh, rightly or wrongly, and I have argued with the businessmen that this is not only Pakistan specific, but this is at the mindset. So anything which you can do in order to facilitate the movement of the goods from one side to other, would create the platform on which this foundation uh, will build. Waka, we'll open it to you. Um, I would ask you to wait till you're recognized. Um, Introduce yourself, uh, wait till the microphone gets to you, and um, keep your comments or your questions relatively brief. Uh, we'll start here first, there second. That wasn't the first one I pointed to, but well, thank you. Den <laughs> Dennis, <laughs> no dinner for you. Okay. <laughs> well, I need to lose weight. So. <laughs> uh, a question and a comment. Uh, the, maybe make the comment first. Uh, going back to your... Want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Dennis Cooks from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, going back to the fascinating chart showing the importance now of having east-west links across Pakistan from India to Central Asia, et cetera, in order for Pakistan to gain the maximum benefit of its geographic position. Uh, seems to me th the western part depends on what happens in Afghanistan. Because if you have a, re well, and that's a big question mark. So it seems to me, and this is to some extent actually in India and Pakistan's hands, that if they are able to work out and are, uh, if they're happy with what happens in, in Afghanistan after 2014, uh, when ISAF departs largely, uh, you'll have a positive outcome. If not, you can forget about that western area. That's the comment. The question um, from a non-economist. Today, uh, the Indian rupee is about 50 to a dollar. The Pakistani rupee is about 90 to a dollar. What does that mean in terms of trade? Uh, I had a personal experience, I, but I don't want to well, I'll mention it, but I don't want to elaborate now because I'm not an economist. Uh, about a year ago, I was in Delhi, wanted to get a pair of pants made in uh, Khan Market, went down there, khaki pants, and they wanted $40. And I said, gee, that's pretty expensive. <laughs> and so I didn't do it. And the next week, I was in Karachi in the Marriott and went to the tailor shop and s said, how much is it going to cost for the similar pair of pants? And they said $15. So I had them made. And I'm wondering if you, you know, if, was that a special case or is that, can you generalize from that in terms of the comparative advantage, if that's what you call it, that Pakistan has? Bill was shaking his head, so I had it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear anybody being asked. Anyone specifically want to talk either about Afghanistan or comparative advantage? Yeah. Um. <coughs> Afghanistan, uh, you know, the uh, a Pakistan's fairly well-developed uh, transport industry is run by uh, people who live in the, in the border areas of Afghanistan and Pakistan. A, it's some of the largest uh, flows of remittances uh, go to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Fata. I, I'm convinced that if, if we begin to think about that region, not so much from the perspective of who's going to control Kabul uh, for our geopolitical whatever, but start to think about it, about it in terms of creating business <coughs> opportunities and employment opportunities for the people who live in that region, uh, they will change. They will change very quickly. They're very adaptable people. Uh, They've had to deal with the resource uh, poor area for a long time, and they've been the largest Pathan city, as you know, is Karachi. So uh, I have no doubt that once the, the big guys get out of the power games, uh, people will very quickly settle down to very productive economic exchanges. Uh, so I'm 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 not so worried. Um, uh, fantastic, the exchange rate story is, uh, sounds great. 
um, you know, if, uh, if uh, I, I still think that the rupee is, Pakistani rupee is somewhat overvalued. We've not kept with the, with the uh, inflation, uh, adjusted uh, the nominal value of the rupee mm -hmm. given the inflation in Pakistan. Um, I think uh, sometimes uh, if you're rich, you have to pay for it. And India's accumulation of reserves means that it is, uh, you know, the rupee is gaining in strength. That's fantastic for Pakistan. I think if, if this continues, uh, Pakistan will benefit. Uh, can I just, yeah. Uh, uh, firstly, on, on Central Asia, uh, uh, actually that's the line I had, I didn't repeat. I said change focus from geopolitics to geoeconomics, so I agree completely with that. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, if, I forgot, if I've not forgotten my geography, Pakistan has a border with Iran. Yes, so it really yes. doesn't require going yes. through Afghanistan, but let me leave that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the third point on exchange rates, by the way, the, one of the important ways in which we cope with that huge uh, reduction in tariffs is exactly the exchange rate. So th that, in a way, is already favorable. So that's a very good uh, point that you made. Uh, the exchange rate is already favorable, and people always forget this. You know, they always think of the tariffs, but the exchange rates are just, unless you stop it from adjusting. And that can make a big, big difference. It has in India. Uh, but to take full advantage of the services, in fact, actually, that's also a very good question uh, because that's exactly what happened in the Sri Lanka case. The businessmen saw much more uh, uh, possibilities in services across the border. And therefore, the move to uh, go from a FTA to a SEPA in the Sri Lanka case uh, was also supported by the business people because and, and that, that's an excellent point. And in fact, I forgot to say, and you provide me with an opportunity, I would suggest that Pakistani economists talk to the Sri Lankan ones who've been involved in managing both the economics and the politics so that they don't have to go through us. You can find out for yourself uh, how, how they dealt with this issue. I just wanted to um, say that Amin and I were both at this lifestyle exhibition in um, Delhi where 650 Pakistani businessmen had come to sell their wares. And the most lucrative business was done by the textiles, and particularly these cotton lawn for women. They were just sold like hotcakes. So there will be some places where Pakistani goods will sell well in India, and there will be some where Indian goods, for example, the auto parts. Japanese um, industry in Pakistan is very happy that the borders will open up and they will import the parts from India rather than from Japan. Services is an area where tradable uh, services are very few, but in stitching, for example, or sewing, perhaps Pakistan is cheaper than India, but how many Dennis Cooks will, you, will get to get that? Uh, my name is Samar Chatterjee from Safe Foundation. Um, I'd try to provide a little perspective that may be different from all the pre presentations, and the reason for that is that if you, if you have a good perspective on the history, Pakistan was created by the British and supported by the United States to c continue this conflict that has gone on between India and Pakistan. And it was very successfully done, and it is uh, that conflict has continued successfully. Now, the only way that can be changed, now that the U.S. is taking a different position on that, is for U.S. to provide both insurance and financing. There was a concern expressed that there's no bank uh, financing it, because there will be some terrorist attacks in India as the border is open. So somebody's got to pay for all those <laughs> blow-ups and destruction that will occur, and I'm sure India has a big heart to take some of that, uh, provided somebody pays for restoration of that. Um, and therefore, if United States, right now it is supporting India in many different ways, many financing, many projects, maybe you should also finance the cross-border trade and insurance. Insurance is a major thing because when things blow up, somebody's got to pay for all that for to be restored. And so that United States has changed its position um, that the conflict was the only way Pakistan would want the United States to have a base in Pakistan and continue to, because that was the rationale given at that time, that Pakistan will not survive if, if 
British walked away and the United States walked away. Is and there a take it over. question here or you so just the, want to make a comment? The, the, that is the comment. And the question is, is the United States willing to do that, provide the financing to just reverse what they've been doing from 1947 mm -hmm. to maybe a few years ago? Because U.S. policy has only changed in the last two or three, and we don't know you, the way U.S. acts, it may change again. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think we have someone here who's going to represent uh, the U.S. government, though we have people from the State Department here, and if, as we, they get the microphone during the course of the uh, day, if they would like to speak on behalf of the U.S. government, they're welcome to do so. Back in the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, Karthik Ramakrishnan. I'm a fellow. Uh, at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And my focus is, is uh, my, my scholarship is mostly based on immigration in the US, but I do remember enough from my IR training to note that um, you know th this, this hope for a peace dividend from trade generally has not been uh, borne out from historical experience uh, in, in many different countries. But one thing, two other things potentially could make the difference, and I didn't hear much talk of that. One is foreign direct investment. And I'm wondering if um, the relation to the role of foreign direct investment, both in India and Pakistan, shows any sign of promise uh, in terms of firms investing in uh, capitalists investing in each other's countries, because capital movement is is less subject to shock than trade flows, as as one of those tables you showed, how amazing things can get shut down pretty quickly when there's a political uh, crisis. But then, but then more generally, it also seems like. There's another big body of research showing that once you have stable, established democracies, that also makes it less likely that you'll see um, violent conflict between the two. So, it, you know, what are the prospects for that uh, in Pakistan? Especially, I think, given the particular interests of the military as opposed to small businesses versus large businesses, um, how that might play out in the next few decades. Uh, either any of our speakers wish to address that? Well, I think uh, FDI will flow once you have established business-to-business -business relations through the trade. That's the first step, always. By the way, I don't agree. Uh, if you look at NAFTA, uh, Mexico has actually benefited a great deal from what was happening in relations with the U.S. before NAFTA and after NAFTA. So that is a major issue. And India, Sri Lanka... Uh, free trade agreement is another uh, uh, manifestation. So I believe that trade is the precursor for FDI flows. FDI flows will not take place. There are now talks between Pakistani businessmen and Indian businessmen for joint ventures, and that will promote FDI. But that joint venture is dependent on the flow of goods from each other's countries. So that, I think, is the issue. Joshua, let's go over here. Okay, in the back and then down here. Mm -hmm. Sudan. Uh, hi, I'm Sudan Ndhumi. I'm with the American Enterprise Institute. And I have a question about the messaging of trade and specifically um, how this messaging works in Pakistan. Now, from what I understand reading the Pakistani press, I believe there are basically two, two, no two narratives that I see. One, which is a relatively minor narrative put forth by economists and people who understand trade, which unfortunately is a very, very small number of people, um, is along the lines of what Dr. Nabi spoke about in terms of the benefits, the economic benefits to, to Pakistan. Um, but there seems to be another narrative, which is really that um, this, is, um, this is sort of a concession. Uh, Pakistan is making a concession to India uh, and, and, and a gesture of goodwill and so on. And I'm wondering whether, uh, what do you think of the prospects for this trade relationship achieving its potential if the latter, which is that this is seen as a kind of, some sort of geopolitical concession, uh, dominates the former, which is that this is in fact in Pakistan's rational economic self-interest. Because on the other side of the border, if you look at how this is being play playing out in India, uh, one theme that occurs over and over is this idea that, that India and Pakistan are approaching something similar to the way India and China have. So in India, it's almost implicit that, well, um, at least among one group of people, that India and Pakistan can trade 
and that means that we can sort of put every uh, put other stuff on the back burner as india indeed india and china have done and so there's it's as though the the stories that the two countries are telling about this are different and i just wanted to uh, if i wonder if dr nabi and Do or dr hussain could could sort of address this issue of of messaging yeah. i think i think you're you're absolutely right i i think uh, the narrative has for a long while been the dominant narrative is, as you say, that this is somehow a concession, particularly uh, in the area that I focused on, which is if Pakistan were to become a regional hub for trade flows, uh, giving access to India to transit through Pakistan is, uh, is still being seen as a major concession. Um, but, and, 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 you know, when this basic report that I talked about was done initially, uh, senior people in the government in, in, in Pakistan, they said, yes, but we are thinking about using liberalization as a, as a, as a negotiating tool, uh, that if things move on some political front, then we will move on the trade front. But I think the debate has moved on uh, on that somewhat. I, people are now beginning to say that uh, even if you want to use uh, trade for political purposes, then you can't use something that doesn't exist. Uh, once you have trade, once you have multiple relations with each other, uh, then uh, you know the spoilers also become. Uh, uh, somewhat managed because it's a complex, multiple uh, engagement with each other. Uh, so the risky behavior is, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, moderated by that. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is that uh, if you want to use uh, an economic relationship uh, as a political tool, you, you use it if it exists. So I think the changing is there's a change in thinking. Um, uh, about it, as a, but but the transit trade issue is still very early stages. There, a lot more work will need to be done to establish that this is largely in Pakistan's interest when Pakistan begins to imagine itself as a hub in the region. Just very briefly, could I uh, add? Uh, you know, it's also uh, important for Pakistanis to understand the uh, kind of change which has taken place in India. Till '91 this concession idea still was there uh, in some Indian minds. It's no longer there. We are looking at things in the growth pole sense. It's really Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, it's very important to keep that in mind. I think there are very few people who look at it as if we are going to get something uh, out of this from Pakistan in an economic sense. The political part is more important in a way. Yeah, I saw a hand there, and then uh, Joshua will come down here next. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um. My name is Takeuchi. I'm a Japanese scholar specializing in South Asian studies um, in Johns Hopkins University. Um, already, um, Mr. Hussain uh, mentioned to the uh, uh, auto industry in, uh, uh, in Pakistan, uh, India, but uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, to ask you some more specifically for the uh, uh, question. Um, um, yeah, Japan's Big three, you know, uh, manufacturers of auto, automakers. Um, that is a Suzuki and um, uh, um, Honda and the Toyota, as in uh, uh, they look at in uh, uh, Karachi and Lahore, and um, uh, in also Indian side. And so, um, according to Suzuki Maruti, uh, um, they are now ex exchanging the, their workers uh, between two countries. Um, so. They are um, Pakistani workers from Karachi, and they they have a training in Guru Gaon's uh, Suzuki Multi Factory now. Um, but it's um, they said that um, the exchange of uh, uh, components, uh, mutual trade of uh, their parts, um, it has been very very slow and a very small uh, number of items only. And so um, I'd like to ask Mr. Hussain that. Um, what is the uh, Pakistan side uh, policy of uh, uh, promotion of old industries more? Uh, it's a, if you put together, you know, it, it's a big uh, number of uh, uh, car, uh, you know, uh, industrial base. You know, uh, if you put the uh, these two countries together. So, uh, wh what about your uh, policy of promotion? And um, also, I'd like to ask uh, Indian side. 
Thank you. Yeah, uh, if you look at the uh, composition of the negative list, after 1,209 items, 385 pertain to the automobile sector. So it's still very much protected for the time being because of this concern that the scale of economies in India side, especially on the parts and um, equipment, are quite substantially favoring the Indian exporter. For the time being, uh, this is not being allowed. But after December 2012, when this negative list disappears, then I think there will be more exchange uh, between the, but as you know, unlike India, Pakistan auto industry is dominated by the Japanese. There's nobody else there. Therefore, the Japanese manufacturers are very much happy that this trading relationship will come in. But the auto part industry is on a different uh, ball game. They want to protect themselves. Okay, uh, Nisha, getting the microphone to you. Hold on. Uh, this is a question for Ishrat. Uh, well, um, Nisha, I know who you are, but not everybody does if you'll introduce yourself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm uh, Nisha Taneja. I'm a professor at the Indian Council for Research and International Economic Relations in New Delhi. I wish there were more Indians here, and I'm uh, really missing that today <laughs> in the sense that it would have been a very balanced uh, view on both sides if there were more Indians, and we would have heard uh, more. Maybe it also means that more people should be working on India-Pakistan trade in India. Having said that, uh, well, one qu the question that I, was, that, that I had in mind was, there is a lot of heartburn over trade deficits. And how did Pakistan then manage its trade deficit um, heartburn vis-a-vis -vis China? Maybe there would be lessons for India there. And even though when I looked at very basic back of the hand calculation, I found that the trade imbalance uh, ratio uh, to total trade is actually much worse vis-a-vis -vis China than it is vis-a-vis -vis India. So even then, the heartburn is more for India than for China. And the other related question is, uh, uh, you're talking a lot about small and medium enterprises. Uh, so what, uh, what was the strategy there for China when there was opening up and with the FTA? And <laughs> the other thing is that, Again, if I can add my comment uh, to it, uh, I think we should maybe sequence it in this manner that we do the large firms first and then follow it by the small and medium. Because the borders, the institutions of the borders have to change. And that can happen only if we allow best practice large firms, large logistic firms to operate across the borders. Once that happens, the small firms can be pulled along. Thanks. I think you're right about the small firms, but I had in mind the whole triangle, which is Gujrawala, Gujarat, Daska, and Sialkot, where these is all small industries, medium industries, they have goods which they can sell across the border to Punjab and Haryana and all the way to Delhi at much cheaper prices than their competitors are able to do. It's, it's a fan industry, it's a sports goods industry, it is surgical goods industry, it is uh, sport, uh, uh, plastic uh, industry, it is ceramic industry. They are very, very uh, confident that they will be able to outclass uh, the competitors, at least in this region, because of the transportation costs and the lo low cost of production, and also the exchange rate is very favorable. So if you do not encourage them, then you are actually creating something in the uh, media uh, hands which will say, look, we told you that these small and medium enterprises who can do business in India are being discriminated. So I thought this should not happen. Everybody should have a level playing field so that they can penetrate to the Indian market. Uh, therefore, I don't believe that we should go for sequencing. Now, the trade imbalance, the idea is that China and Pakistan have been friends for <laughs> 60 years, whether it was Mao's period or whether it is Deng Xiaoping or whether Jiang Zemin, it has always been there, whether it was Benazir or Nawaz Sharif or military government. This is a, s s a relationship which has not uh, gone through ups and downs. Here we are trying to have a complete new paradigm shift in India-Pakistan relations. 
Therefore, we don't want to jeopardize the five years or 10 years progress. If India is seen to be creating an imbalance in the bilateral trade, that's why I suggested that you must consider at least some voluntary export restraints for some time on some items which may be uh, speeding up this trade imbalance. That's a caution, that's a prudence. Japan has done that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US, so I think that is what I suggest that we do. Yeah. Um, I, I really think that uh, the small and medium enterprises in Pakistan are very competitive. And uh, whatever I've seen of the studies of the Gujarat fan manufacturers, uh, motorcycle parts manufacturers, uh, the light engineering sector, I, and I really think that they will see India as the, as the big opportunity. And, you know, they're extremely important politically, the small and medium uh, ent entrepreneurs, because they, if, if there is a conservative tr underlying um, a, a t trend in all of this, uh, it comes from uh, the, the small and medium guys, and they have to see directly the benefits of liberalization, which is why I really think ignoring them will, will not be a good idea. I call the China deficit, you know, Pakistanis think of it as friendly fire. <laughs> you know, they, they suffer. A lot of them suffer. I mean, the shoe manufacturers, for example, a whole host of them, they suffer. But in the end, there's this argument that, oh, in the, you know, China is an old friendship and we will somehow come out of it okay. Uh, but there's real suffering. And, and I really think that it's because they are able somehow to deal with that, the Chinese uh, competition, that I remain very optimistic in liberalizing trade with India. Because a, I, I think Pakistani small and medium enterprises will give a tough competition to Indian small and medium enterprises and not so much to the Chinese. There are two people here that I want to bring into the conversation. One is uh, Charles Ebinger uh, and then Mohsen Khan. I don't even know if your hand's been uh, raised, but we want to hear from you. Charles Evans, Ebinger. Uh, Charlie Ebinger from uh, Brookings, and thank you very much. Um, I was surprised that none of you mentioned as major factors in uh, bilateral trade between India and Pakistan, what I would regard as two of the most important. And one is energy and the other is water. Uh, quite clearly, there have been you know, talks for many years about how India, with its plans for nuclear power, might build a nuclear station in the Punjab, which could then uh, export power to the starved star power region of, uh, of Punjab in Pakistan. We're sitting down there in the Tar Desert, granted major problems in developing it, but with some of the largest coal reserves in the world sitting near the industrial heartland of Gujarat, and with India's power deficit, it seems a natural way to go. We're now looking at probably gasifying uh, in the fields themselves uh, and moving, uh, moving the power that way. Uh, we see uh, in, in the Kashmir, of course, uh, there are new plans by India to build dams which ha would have negative impacts on some of Pakistan's irrigation, which are problems that clearly need to be met because they also have major implications for industry. And with many cities in both India and Pakistan not having power for 15 hours a day, we're not going to solve the problem of textile manufacture, whether it's high tech or not, if we don't have adequate power supplies. And if I could just make one additional comment, uh, kind of on broader India's uh, energy situation with its neighbors. For 10 years, I sat as the negotiator for the government of Nepal in trying to do cross-border trade with India. And we argued that because Nepal would be flooded uh, and provide downstream irrigation and uh, potable water benefits and flood control, that that ought to be considered in the tariff. And for 10 years, I heard successive power ministers say no, no, no. Not no, we'll negotiate, but no. And the same thing with deals with Bangladesh and Myanmar. While the Indian cabinet dithered, the Chinese took away the Myanmar gas fields, and we know the, the history with Bangladesh. So I'm just saying the liberalization has to center on energy and water, or neither country is going to be able to proceed with its economic development. 
before anyone addresses to that, uh, Mosin, you want to put anything on the table? We'll ask Mosin to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mosin Khan. I'm at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, I, I'm sorry I was late in coming to listen to all of you, um, but there was a good reason for that. Uh, the World Bank was having a, a seminar on Pakistan, the untold story. And people in the panel, just for your information, were expected to, to give some positive news about Pakistan. This is, so, and I, in fact, talked about India-Pakistan trade. So um, I, I'm in the, in the mood, in a sense. <laughs> but let me, uh, let me just, uh, I, I, I would like to just make two points. Um, one is, is uh, while I didn't hear the presentations, I have a pretty good idea on what was said uh, on that. One thing that I would say when you, when you ask the question, Bob, about what could be done, and I'm sure that all the reasons given by the panelists are terrific on what could be done in order to make the sort of process continue and not get uh, pushed off course. In my mind, it's something that I think uh, Professor Taneja is going to talk about this afternoon, is infrastructure. Uh, one th a big constraint that we, have, we don't actually pay too much attention to is Infrastructure, and infrastructure defined as physical, legal, regulatory, all these come under that way. Once you have capital investments taking place, in the, that sort of starts making the, 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 the possibilities of trade between the two countries much more sort of permanent in, in that sense. So I think that, to me, is, a, is important. One minor point I would make uh, in response to Arvind. Um, Arvind, we have done studies now. We've completed two case studies one on Bangladesh, uh, India trade, and one on Sri Lanka, India trade. And that's precisely for the reason that you mentioned, which is there are a lot of lessons for Pakistan to be learned in that. I think the final comment I would make is <laughs> ultimately, well, the negative list is going to be eliminated by the end of this year in Pakistan. Ultimately, the issue boils down to winners and losers. And I, I, I guess that's what the losers lobby uh, uh, point came up. In Pakistan, we have not done a, ver a serious analysis of the winners and losers yet. I mean, there's been some work done, but I think uh, they, they, there needs to be further work done. But one last comment I would make on that is people get too hung up on the winners and losers issue because they view trade as some, some static concept, which it is not. <laughs> and I am constantly pushing the argument that, look, you, you don't know what kind of goods will be traded between the two countries tomorrow. You may know today, but that's just a photographic point in time. So I think that, that the arguments that I've been pushing is precisely that, that we didn't know. I mean, the case of India is more, more uh, of an example. Ten years ago, you would not have predicted what India would be exporting based on what India's structure, industrial structure was. And I, I think given Pakistan's industrial structure now, it's not going to be the standard textiles, et cetera, that we would be exporting, on, although we'd probably move up high and the higher value added. But I think what's going to happen in Pakistan is, is, is new products are going to be developed, as we've seen with lawn just now in, uh, in Pakistan. So I, I think people, w what we have to continue to do is push the decision makers. And I will say that in the case of Pakistan, it is also the military. Um, which is um, a very important constituency there in, in Pakistan. Uh, we have to continue to push to demonstrate the advantages on the trade front. Then you will get, as Ishrat said, foreign direct investment, that'll be another one. Banking, that'll be another one. And then you trade in services and so on. And then you can start solving the much larger problems. To me, the biggest breakthrough, sorry for taking so long, the biggest breakthrough has been to separate trade from the other important issues that, that have bedeviled, economic, bedeviled relations between the two countries for so many years. Thank you. Thanks, Mosin. Um, let's give each of our panelists one more cr uh, crack. Ijaz, we'll start with you. We've got two different types of issues on the table here. Well, I, I mean, Mosin, I, the, the, none of what Mosin said requires an answer. I mean, these <laughs> so I p fully agree with. Uh, with what he said, and it extends the debate. But I think on the energy and water issue, uh, the reason why I cast the bilateral trade relation with India f in the regional perspective from Pakistan's side 
is because it helps get over many of the hang-ups, the historical hang-ups, and just thinking about the old relationship. But to go back to connecting Eastern and Western markets, which was the role that you played historically, go back there, take a regional perspective, bilateral trade with India falls, is, a, is an important part of that puzzle. I really think India needs to think about water and energy in the same way. A, a, you know, we share the same water system. We share the, the mountain system that, 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 that forms the basis for that water. Uh, we are uh, upper riparians and, and, and lower riparians. I really think thinking about water issue from the perspective of Delhi uh, or the perspective of Islamabad or Dhaka doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I think a, just as Pakistan needs to think about bilateral trade with India in a regional context, I think India needs to think about water in a regional context. Well, very briefly, uh, for four months I was in charge of the water division. I've uh, been in charge of many different things. Um, but uh, one of the things uh, you learn is that uh, there are interstate disputes in India. And some of those have been going on for 20 years. Uh, and in the planning commission in India, for which I, uh, I was there for roughly half the time, uh, that uh, the planning commission as the body which uh, interacts with the states, that has been one of our concern for years. So it really, you have to have your objectives clear. Uh, is it that you want to promote uh, better relations, or do you want to start with issues which are going to be conflicting. Water is an issue which, even within the states, between Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh, we have not been able to sort out. There have been commissions for, uh, there have been, I think, N, you know, like in 10 uh, uh, commissions. It's a very, very contentious issue when, when there is a shortage on both sides. <coughs> so it depends. One thing, uh, uh, and here, uh, uh, Ijaz mentioned that water was the issue with Bhutan. The point is, if there is a surplus on one side, then it's very easy. But uh, the key uh, uh, issue here uh, was that Bhutan wanted to use it for economic development. Uh, and so the attitude is critical in, on both sides, definitely. There's no question about it. But you also have to have on both sides an attitude that this is not something you want to raise because it will create conflict, but because you want uh, to use it to benefit uh, both sides. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. I'm saying that from our internal ones. They are like tens of water disputes within India. And uh, unless you have the right perspective, they cannot be solved. They haven't been. I think on energy, there is uh, good news that the two petroleum secretaries had a meeting whereby India is bringing in the refinery uh, to Batinda uh, which will provide the refined products by 50 kilometers, uh, either a pipeline or by trucks. And then there is also uh, gas, uh, which is being, uh, you know, um, at Bhatinda, which is also being connected to Pakistan. So, but the energy shortage problem is both sides, it's just not one side. So cooperation between the two will help a great deal. But it is the Punjab area in Pakistan which is very badly hurt on the gas particularly. I was in Faisalabad and as you rightly pointed out, half of the textile industry is shut down because they can't get the gas. So this Batinda uh, gas pipeline will help a great deal in overcoming that problem. But long run, I think we have to have a, a completely, um, what I call as the multilateral regional strategy for uh, gas. And Pakistan has been toying with the <coughs> Afghanistan, Turkmenistan pipeline, which also goes to India, Pakistan, Iran pipeline, which also goes to India. So there are many options on the table, but uh, no, nothing has happened. On the water, I think we have to go back to the 1960s where the rivers of Punjab were divided between 
India and Pakistan and the Indus Basin works were carried out, which resulted in mutual benefits to two. With the climate change taking place and the Himalayan glaciers uh, melting much more rapidly, there is a, a fear that the whole Indus Basin will suffer and that will uh, be not in the interest of India or Pakistan or Bangladesh. Therefore, we have to put together uh, a strategy which is beyond the borders of each of these two country, or three countries. And there must be an integrated management of the Indus Basin uh, if we have to avoid the pitfalls of uh, the shortages of food and production in 2030, 2040, when this problem will become more intense. And I think uh, the um, point which Mohsen make, the, my major emphasis is that we must have a solid <coughs> foundation for enduring and making relationships on trade a long-term phenomena. Otherwise, the winners will never appear on the scene because they do not know whether they're going to trade tomorrow or not. So, uh, Nisha, my whole emphasis is that India should not really mind if they take a little bit of, uh, you know, back bench seat on the trade relations. Let this bloom, let this grow, and then both sides will benefit. But if it becomes too much of one-sided affair with all the stress deficit, the dynamic impact of the uh, trade on the productivity, efficiency, and growth on both sides will be subdued. So this is why I've been emphasizing on the foundation being much stronger. Well, I think we've come to a point where we ought to break for lunch. Um, I, in fact, have an announcement about lunch. But before that, if you will all join me in a round of applause for all three of our speakers. It's astonishing to me how quickly the morning went, and I think that's clearly a testament uh, 